Uh, so my <coughs> name is Sofia Feltzing, and I have put a slide on the screen uh, which tells you what I work on. I work on the Milky Way as a galaxy. And that's what interests me. Uh, it's full of stars, and as we've heard today, there is tons of planets around stars, so I think that's something that brings us together. And uh, Anders asked me to put together some questions and make this group of people have a bit of a debate or something. And he wanted it with a bit of Milky Way slant to it. That's hence the Gaia image uh, of the Milky Way. Um, right, they've seen the questions. Or the, the things before, the comments, the questions. Uh, and maybe we also would like some input from you guys in the audience, don't we? Yeah? So should we ask them first? <laughs> and then you can tell them what it's like. <laughs> and I'm not sure we're going to get through all of this because it might turn out to a lot of debate. I think we need a bit of light, right? Because I, I have not traveled very far, but I am feeling jet lagged. And you who have traveled far are probably feeling very jet lagged by now. So, in my community, there are people who work on cool stars. Of course, all stars are cool, but cool stars can mean a lot of different things, but a lot of it can also be the FGK type dwarf of stars or giants. And there's a considerable interest. Fan, where are you? Is he hiding? No, he's not here. Um, he's still doctor. Sorry? He's still the doctor. Oh, I see. Okay. He uh, survived the talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably my fault. He, he, he's very wise not to be here because he is an expert on this. He's the considerable interest and effort put into finding something that we call solar twins. And by that we mean stars that are very, very, very much like the, the sun. Not just kind of solar-like, right? Which I think we all say are very cool stars and interesting. So my question is to the, maybe to the experts we start with here. How interesting are these stars to work on for characterizing exoplanet or hunting exoplanets? Um, you know, is it worth this really quite extra effort that some people go into in detail? Uh, well, you are nodding yeah, so sagely, you, you're, sure. you're, you're jumping. Yeah, I can say I, I love solar twins and I, I'm partial to them <laughs> because my, uh, my office mate in grad school, Megan Vidal, did a lot of her thesis working on solar twins. Um, and I, I could just say one of my, one of my, I, a few of my favorite things about them. I think that, um, as Sarah alluded to in her talk earlier, often our uncertainty on the properties of the planets is really determined by our uncertainty and our knowledge of the stars. And so we need to measure the stellar masses and the stellar radii as precisely as we can in order to get those quantities well determined for the planets. And for solar twins, it's possible to do this at much higher precision no. because the no, stars Stefan are so... Stefan is jumping up at so what? Similar, you don't yeah. think so? Uh, I think what she's saying is correct. That, but. Uh, but then that the sun or solar t twins yeah. are the best stars, I don't agree. Yeah. Because, mm. for example, for the noise, for the detection, mm. Mm. they are m much worse than gay stars, for example. Yeah. Uh, mm. So, and also there's another aspect is the diversity of the planetary mm. characteristics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we will be able at the end to say something meaningful only if we understand this diversity. Mm -hmm. So focusing on just one type of star is not good. Yeah, no, I totally, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't say only solar twins. I, I say, yes, solar twins too. I, like for, you know, for example, something that it may, may be uniquely possible with solar twins is to, um, if you know the mass and the radius of your planet precisely enough, you can actually start to infer what its bulk composition mm -hmm. Is. So, for example, Jupiter in our own solar system is actually a little bit smaller in radius than you would expect for a planet of its mass, and that's because the envelope is enriched with heavy elements. And it's possible to do this for exoplanets as well to get a statistical measurement of the overall bulk density <coughs> of, of these objects in a way that we've been trying to do with the atmospheres with great observational effort, but if you get good enough mass and radius statistics, you can just do it with that. And only with solar twins, I think, is it possible to get the level of precision that you need. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but so what would your favorite star be that people should uh, spend K extra? K-stars. K-stars, well, K -stars K -stars could because be they are lower of... masses, so you detect with the same precision lower yeah. mass planets in an easy way. Yeah. Uh, they are more quiet. Yeah. So yes. you will get rid of all the, the perturbation of the star. The habitable zone is closer, but yeah. not too close not to too get close. to the... Yeah. And, and so the sweet spot for me is K-star. Ross, are the K-stars more easy to understand? <laughs> the, the only <laughs> <Because> drawback <laughs> is, is uh, 
the age determination and what you can get for my stereosismology because that might become difficult. So are there so any early advantages with K dwarfs? Uh, no, I mean, I would agree with what Stefan just said. <laughs> <laughs> but K giants wouldn't be so good, right? All giants are no. terrible, yeah. so especially the late should, should you tell Should you K tell dwarfs. people why giants are so terrible? <laughs> Don't no, get started. No, no, um, I, I, I think you might actually be the better one to, to <laughs> answer this particular uh, question. Um. Because we only heard about dwarfs here, right? Okay, yeah. so, so we are following since, since 10... Since people here <coughs> are not experts, why not? Gi because the giant stars are tons more bright. And there's yes, lots of, you very can see, bright. You can see them to further distances and all these yeah. great yeah. things. They have another... Uh, oh, uh, shh. Wait, sorry for not looking your way. Uh, well, I mean, they've got a really big radius, though. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's on, yeah. It doesn't uh, okay. help. Yeah. Uh, I'm Malcolm. Malcolm Friedland. Yeah. The K stars have a nice, in a, a K giants are nice in a variety of things. One of them is actually that you can age determine them better. So, for instance, uh, we worked on one recently where you can actually say that it is. Uh, 10.7 giga years plus minus one and a half giga year according to the models instead of having errors of three, four, five giga years. But apart from that, they might not be so good for other reasons. So, Well, they are, they are intrinsically variable. Yeah. So if you go to the later type like K, K5 to then that's exactly what people are, are choosing in a seismology for giants because they know they will see the signal. And we have been following 600 stars, giant stars, in radial velocity CT since uh, 15 years as a backup because they are so bright. You yeah. can you can do it also time. in bad weather, exactly. right? Yeah. And because you expect some jitter from the star itself, so you don't aim for the highest precision. Mm -hmm. But then there is no overlap between our 600 stars and the one that the task, the, the test, uh, as our seismology team will do. That they be choose, be because that they we choose, choose the early one that are intrinsically ah, yeah. stable, and yeah. they choose the later one. Because they are fun to work on if you do yeah. seismology. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's also fair enough. No, but okay. also just as long as you're sensitive to uh, the ratio between the radii of the star and the planet, you mm -hmm. prefer it to be a small planet. It's, <laughs> it's very simple. So, so if your signal depends on the area of your atmospheric annulus around the planet relative to the radius of the surface area of the star, well then, So for that, M, M, M dwarfs would be the best, but M those, those would be are great. problematic for yeah. other reasons. On so the other end, with the giant star, the planets yeah. are further out. So if you see a transit mm -hmm. and the, the star is big, so the probability is good. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, then so? you get a, a warm or even colder giant planet. Mm -hmm. And then you learn about the dependence on the temperature and irradiation. Yeah. I, can, I can think of another reason altogether why why solar twins are so interesting, mm -hmm. and I think it's because um, not through the lens of detecting planets today, but through the lens of trying to understand the planet history in our own solar system. So I think there's a, a hypothesis, at least, that our own sun has consumed planets previously. There's some signature for that in the atmospheric composition of our own sun, in particular, like the ratio of different volatiles um, to one another, we, we think. Um, that would explain a number of things, including like the very strange orbit uh, of Mercury, um, the fact that it's incredibly iron enhanced as though a collision has occurred, um, and the fact that if you trace the minimum mass solar nebula, there's just a ton of mass missing uh, interior to Mercury. So uh, Catherine Volk, for example, at, at UCLA did some work on this. Comparing to solar twins would be a way of saying, is our star unusual in that composition? Does mm -hmm. it seem like many sun-like stars consumed planets previously? What would that mean about the inherent stability uh, of planetary systems? And <coughs> right, and also in terms of characterizing the atmospheres of giant planets, which presumably accreted gaseous material of the same composition as the star, if you have a solar twin, it's possible to measure the stellar composition much more precisely than you could for another type of star. And so if, you're, if you care about the, the carbon to oxygen ratio or the abundance of refractory which elements, which we do, then we can go <laughs> try to measure that for the planet as well and compare it to the stellar composition. Yeah, but you don't need to have exact twins to do that. That would work for LG and LK. Yeah. The closer, the closer to a twin, the better. Yeah, but also, if we, if we were to find a solar system out there that 
actually looks like ours and, and there is an Earth twin in the habitable zone of this Sun twin. I mean, we're all going to get really, really, really excited. But as I showed you, if you want me to find oxygen in it, it, it will take uh, a lot of observing time over the course of 100 years. Do you ask me if it's worth it? Yes. Um, I, I don't know if it's a good idea for a PhD project, um, but it certainly is worth considering doing. Hopefully we can do better from collaborating with space people. Maybe we won't need 100 years. Um, but the problem is then after 100 years, I can tell you it's got oxygen, but I can't tell you of its chemistry overall. I've only managed to detect oxygen in it, so I can't exactly say it's got life. I can just say it's got oxygen, so that's worth remembering. Yep. <laughs> okay, so I have added a, a sneaky question, but I think the answer is yes, probably okay. Plato, as you heard, is a mission coming along, and so it's reference star, which everyone is studying in order to understand how to flow the data and things, which I find interesting. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, uh, is a kind of solar-like star. So this is good or bad? I think. Do, do you know why? No, because you, tell, you know more about Plato than me. That's yeah. why I put it in there. Sorry. No, no, it's because that's the toughest case, yeah. the most difficult case. If you can do that, you can do all the others. Yes, that's why. <laughs> that's why we define it that way. Yeah, exactly. Very good. So I would like to move on to something that has to do a little bit more with the Milky Way and which I would be interested to know because I like stars in ensembles. You now have ensembles of, of exoplanets. So stars move in the Milky Way. You guys said, you, you say, here's the star and the planets and the planets are moving, but the actual star itself will move. So we know it migrates maybe several, you know, kiloparsecs, right? Um, so it might be born and formed in an environment that's entirely different from where you find it today. So in your opinion, does, uh, and it might also end up on, on very weird orbits, of course, how does this inflict on your ability to predict where we should find stars with life in our galaxy and other galaxies, or so, yeah, as a ha galactic habitable zone, or in general for your understanding? I mean, how much does it impact? Does, does it matter even? <laughs> I think, well, from a practical standpoint, we're always looking at stars that are very, very close to us. Yeah, but they might have come <laughs> they to might have come away. away. Yeah. That's the point, right? They could yeah. have come from outside, they could have come from inside. Yeah. And I know that most of you are what we call the thin disks, the stars that are very, so, you know, moving very in the plane, but they can still get walloped a long way. <laughs> Does it matter? I, I think it is very interesting if we have that extra information, if we know where a star is from, if we know how old it is, if we know if it formed in a dense environment or not. I think that we're quite far away from being capable of using that information, but on, on the, in the long run, Would I think it's Would you be nervous if I important. could tell you that at least dynamicists tell me that the star can move from a circular orbit like this to here and you lose all trace of that it was on this orbit? Yeah, but what, what are the important points? It's probably environmental and yeah, also yeah. The, the physical exactly. parameters in the disk that, yeah, that, exactly. that will govern yeah. that. And you have kind of trace of it in the star that is moving with the planet ah, as well. I see. So, okay, so, so that's how you want to solve it. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't think that where, where you are in the galaxy matters really yeah. very much, except if it kills the possibility exactly. to, to Yeah, uh, so what to is this? The so there's something called the galactic habitable zone, right? Sometimes people yeah, talk about but, uh, it. Well, nature, we see from the diversity, when yeah. nature, when it's possible to do something, nature will do it. <laughs> so we, we, what we try to understand you mean is what we, are the parameters. We that, exist, and so if yeah. nature chooses to do something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's definitely a metallicity gradient in the Milky Way. Right? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so uh, well, vertically and, and radially. Yeah. Right. Mm. So I could imagine um, we already know that metallicity plays some kind of role in raw planet occurrence, but mm -hmm. also in planet dynamics. So my guess would be if you had less metal rich uh, environments yeah. in which planets were forming, um, my guess would be that there would be less giant planets, generally speaking, which would be okay. sort of a testable hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Although I would say this question is. Um, it has question. yet to be, yeah, questions. Discussion has, item. <laughs> has like really yet to be constrained observationally. Like yeah. I feel like it's really um, um, observationally starved, I guess. So yeah. we know something about um, planetary systems across the Milky Way from microlensing. Um, yeah. And then we know some um, planets, at least one, Kepler 444 or something, that's definitely like a thick disk mm -hmm. planet that's at least yeah. 11 giga years old. Yeah. So there's something about when the Milky Way started forming planets. But these are a few and far between. Yeah, so how are we going to increase that yield so we can start having a 
uh, more in depth. What, what would give us more of this very old? I think we have wise for one for one reason or, or for Sorry? one thing. Um, wise like a micro lens oh, yeah, yeah. survey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to understand more about the planet um, occurrence across the galaxy. Mm -hmm. I would also That's add to that the, the combination of the all-sky transit surveys that are currently yeah. being done with the Gaia data, which will give us so much more information about the stars. Yeah, so how, how is it with Gaia away? I mean, how far away? Does anyone, Gaia person, dare to answer that, of how far away we detect exoplanet systems? I don't have... Uh, that's the five-year the five release, year release, right? No, no, how far away? Oh. Half a kilometer. Half a kiloparsec, okay. So that's just going to give us a really a bigger volume than we have now then, right? Yeah, Much bigger. by a factor of five or... Yeah, exactly. Well, not the volume, the distance. Yeah. The distance, yeah, yeah. the volume is going to yeah. be even better. Yeah. <laughs> but still, it's, it's not that far away. No, it's not that far away at all. Yeah. No, no, yeah, but yeah, in, no, in but time. <laughs> okay. Mm. Henrietta, Mar uh, microphone, microphone. Henrietta's point wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Henrietta's point about the public perception of all of this is extremely important because um, people won't care so much if they think about planets where the sky is red, but they will care a lot if they think about blue planets with nice beaches and things like that. So, so solar planets are very important, and the fact that they're near to us is very important because then there's some hope in science fiction terms that we can somehow get there. <laughs> Go and miss it, yes. No? Yeah. Well, 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 the microphone is yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, go I, I, on, I was, uh, <laughs> You have to say who you are. I, oh, I'm, I'm Leif Lundblad. I'm, I'm not an astronomer. Uh, I was just wondering, I mean, if, if you say that, well, Sun Twins is not that easy, so we probably... So that basically means that people who are looking from the outside wouldn't even try to find us? <laughs> They wouldn't care. I mean, it's the wrong sort of stuff. Well, I, I think it depends a lot on what kind of system, what kind of solar system they are in. Because I think a lot of our focus on solar twins is no, just I was been thinking in general. We, I mean, we, you're saying we would be rather hard to find. But we're still going to try, probably. Still, for, for yeah. 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 We're trying. They will yeah. try as well. But how? That's a whole other question. But how common is a civilization like ours? I think that we're going to find that micro <laughs> biology is a lot more common than, than something like us. So, so yeah, it will that, probably be difficult. So then I won't <laughs> ask the follow-up question, which yeah. would have been, uh, how can we help them? I've heard that exactly the opposite how can we hide ourselves yeah. like have you seen that like the like the laser cloaking like they one suggestion was that if you wanted to mask the transit of the earth you could have a laser that shines when the earth is transiting and so it would cancel out the 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 block in the cell block. <laughs> you have to have a send a little spacecraft in there. Yeah, right, you have to and you have to point in the right direction. Mm. Yes, that's a bit advanced, is it? But how we is might want to first answer how common life is, like how close by should we expect the nearest life of any kind to be, and then we'll mm. take that question afterwards. <laughs> so what's your take on that, yeah? Well, I was going to say the, th the single thing that we ought to do in order to maximize our probability of encountering other intelligent life is just to survive our own technological yeah. adolescence. Yeah, that's the term dominating. Yeah. <coughs> that's a bit dumb beat. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, no, like we can do something, right? Yeah, <laughs> but that's eminently, yeah, changeable. Yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> so can we help them in any way? find us. Well, we can send signal, as she was saying. Yeah, we can yeah. be radio well, that, that was the answer. Yeah, well, they, they, they are this, I think that's what you were mentioning. I, I'm not sure I understood correctly, but when in some direction, the, the Earth will be transiting. Mm -hmm. And at that time, from the other side of the Earth, yeah. you, you send a, yeah, a you could signal. Do the and, uh, <laughs> we could send out like a Morse code, like yeah. laser frequency thing. And <laughs> they say, oh, this is this annoying star that keeps varying. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can't do proper measurements yeah. on it. Yeah. <laughs> are we sure we're not seeing that? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> there are people thinking about it, actually. Okay, so I also had uh, maybe two other things, but I think if we, let's go to the last one. You know, now it's not doing what I want, but it doesn't matter. So if you had complete freedom to propose and carry out a ground-based instrumentation project or a space mission, what would be your choice? 
you can wish. Well, I, I guess Stefan has already told us everything he's done and what he's going to do. <laughs> well, like, yeah, but, uh, actually, it depends on your priority because you can ask yourself what is missing. And what can be missing is, can be something very practical. And we mentioned UV, for example, that is only available on HST. So then you want to do UV, you have to go to space and design a telescope for that. But then you also can ask yourself, what is the next step? And we want to go to the difficult case of another Earth twin. And, and then it's big telescopes or on the ground or in space. In space, it's still a bit too far. If I want to be practical, so then Henry, it's the she, she has something. What do you want to do? Well, my, my favorite instrument is being planned, and it's the first light instrument at ELT, and it's METIS. Uh, I, I think METIS is an amazing instrument. It's, so what, can uh, it's, you tell us a little bit about it? So it's an IFU. Uh, so this so means that, that it, uh, it has spatial information. So the stuff I was showing you that was um, high contrast imaging combined with high dispersion spectroscopy was just a slit. So with an IFU, you have information about everything that's going on in this area on the sky, but you also have high spectral resolution. Uh, so it's in the uh, near and mid infrared, you've got a so long wavelength range. I guess you could say range. that in every point of the image, you've you actually a have spectrum. a spectrum. Yes. So you have a three-dimensional So we do have some instruments already yeah. that are IFUs, uh, but they are at lower spectral resolution or they're not at the right wavelength range or, you know, there's, there's no perfect combination yet, but uh, METIS will have a spectral resolving power of 100,000, same as Cryos and Cryos Plus. Uh, it would have an enormous wavelength range also covering uh, medium uh, infrared and not just the near infrared. Uh, it will, I mean, it, it will be able to detect life on an Earth-like planet around an M-dwarf. And, and it will be difficult, but it will be possible. Uh, actually, there are other studies <laughs> coupling Sphere and Espresso, yes. for example. Yes. And uh, uh, if you Very believe exciting. in the simulation in 30 nights, you get uh, oxygen in the atmosphere of Proxima B. So he's talking about two instruments that exist already. Mm -hmm. on yeah. The yeah. Then yeah. You, you talked about Espresso before. Yes. You'll be building, and that's also a bundle of, of fiber. Yeah. Yes. So it's, uh, it doesn't have to be a full yeah. eye view. It can just be a bundle yeah. of fibers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. agreed. So, yeah, I, I would add, it, like, in, in imagining instruments that are, are not yet planned and do not exist, what, what I would really like to see in the future is a direct imaging space mission that's capable of imaging Earth-like exoplanets. Because I think that it's, while it is hugely exciting that we'll be able to start probing the atmospheres of Earth-like planets in the next decade or so, we, we don't know whether Earth-like planets around M-dwarfs, the smallest stars, can even hold on to an atmosphere or not. And so I think we're all, you know, we're putting all of our eggs in this M-dwarf basket and, it's, it's, um, and we'll make the first measurements and we'll start to get an idea of whether they have atmospheres. But I think Ultimately, imaging Earth-sized planets around a larger diversity of stars and also a larger sample. Like even if we detected biosignatures in the atmosphere of one planet, that wouldn't tell us definitively that that planet is inhabited. I think we would need a sample of 100 or more where we could start to put into context in terms of what are the other planets in the system and what is the whole inventory of gases in the atmosphere before we can even begin yes. to make claims about habitability. And so for me, what I would like to see is a very large space mission that could do direct imaging of these Earth-like planets big around more sun-like stars. Yeah, yeah big st star shade. Yeah. <laughs> a star shade, that'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you're the one perhaps that knows the most about star shades, I would Just guess. Just being at MIT. Yeah. You mean? Um, <laughs> it's a, a big, fancy cor coronagraph, yeah. kind of, yeah. Or so coronagraph, for those who are not astronomers, at least one an astronomer, mm -hmm. is where you can block out the light of yeah. the star so you can see the other things because of the contrast, it would be too, too high otherwise, right? Um, I think I would have an idea that's more modest and... <laughs> <laughs> But um, it's based on an idea, so so I'm allowed to be wild and, and crazy course. here, and yeah. um, I don't have to pitch modest. it to any, <laughs> any panel. Don't be modest. The idea itself is kind of wild. So it's based on an idea that Jill Tarter had, which was to identify um, signatures of intelligent life from the shape of the planetary silhouette. So you could imagine if you had an intelligent civilization, they might modify the shape of the planet sufficiently, for example, with like a very large solar panel, or there's other ways that you would no, modify. We didn't do that. What do you mean? Yeah. 
We didn't, but we're barely, we're barely. We've talked about making a space elevator, right? Yeah, but we're also like still technological adolescents, truly. So, so let's say that this existed, and this is this can be a pie in the sky idea. I'm not pitching for funding here. This yeah. just will magically exist. Um, that's a new constraint on um, the creation of uh, gigantic structures by um, other civilizations. So it would be possible with incredibly fine photometry, especially during, and only I should say, during the egress of the transit. You could see the difference in the shape of the transit based on whether um, a square silhouette or a circular silhouette was crossing onto the face of the star. Um, um, and that would be doable. What about if there is a moon? And then moon. the moon is, is kind of... Uh, Mimicking a rectangular, <laughs> uh, and uh, then you have to disentangle. So, so the this quality. photometry is so good. Uh, okay. I'm telling you right now, this photometry oh. is so good. There's no noise in those detectors, right? No, no. This this has no noise, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Right, okay. <laughs> so everyone had their wish that <laughs> there is no noise in the detectors. Yeah, yeah. You also heard that Stefan no yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, yeah. And also, freedom. if we could find a way to make all the stars black bodies, exactly, that would be really good. That would help. No, but then long. we don't see the yeah, molecules. Yeah, yeah, right. But you yeah, wouldn't yeah, know yeah, what yeah, elements yeah, were exactly. in the atmosphere, <laughs> then, right? <laughs> right. Does the audience have anything that we, you, some of you have? Yes. Uh, again, we will, you have to wait for the runner. I think actually that the interesting thing is, if I look at that for the way the question is formulated, I wouldn't do anything at the moment. We have so many space missions coming on, and we have so many ground-based things, and they will tell us what we will want after that. I mean, if you look at what we are going to get in the next 10, 15 years from the instruments that are being built, it's going to be so fantastic to be working in exoplanets, and particularly for the young people here. It's going to be tremendous. And we just have to be on our toes and surf on the wave when we find something really interesting. Depending on where it is, if it's close, we need one thing. If it's a bit further out, we need to go to Sarah Seeger and get her star shade or something like that. And if it's very far away, then we're going to need to go back to Darwin and TPF and do some interferometry thing. So, I mean, we don't know what we, what, what we really need in the terms of a space mission or a large ground-based facility before we have sort of got something back from the other things that we are building at the moment. But we need to continue the pressure. I mean, maybe you need to also keep thinking of different solutions for different yeah. things, even if you're not building them sure. yet, right? Sure. Because otherwise you're not ready to do that. That also takes time and effort, right? Sure. Especially the space missions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, is, what is the typical time for a space mission these days? 20 years. Three. 20. 20. It depends 20, on how big. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, like... Malcolm probably has Malcolm the answer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Test was fast. Test yeah. was fast, yeah. Depending on what you do. It depends on where you start from. I Keops mean, is fast too. Sorry? Keops is, Keops is extremely yeah. fast. Yeah. That I is a, it's sort of the answer. size of okay. it. <laughs> she wants to change her answer. She found something I guess she's, she's changing her answer. I want to change my answer, and uh, it's, it wouldn't be a project looking into the sky at all. Ah. I think what, rather what we need, so let's say um, Sarah Seeger likes to say there's life as we know it, and then there's life as we don't know it. Mm -hmm. Presumably, if we were trying to remotely identify life, um, to define life is um, some entity that extracts chemical energy from its environment and replicates itself. It already, at that point, um, fire would count as life. So then you would need to include at least some other uh, um, explanations or criteria in order to identify life. But in order to have uh, some kind of entity that extracts chemical energy, the number of molecules that that life could be comprised of is very large, but it's not infinite. Um, it's around 80,000 to, to hear Sarah um, and others in her group describe it. And so what we really need then is to know what the molecular and atomic transitions are of those 80,000 potential things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have only a tiny, tiny fraction yeah. of knowledge of them. And you might say to yourself, why not just chuck all of these individual things into test tubes and measure them in labs? It's actually incredibly hard to do. So you're giving dangerous, the money to other fields. Dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh. I am, I am. No, but that's where I would put my But that's where I would put my money, I think. Right, okay, so... I changed my answer. Yes. Yeah. Withdraw my previous. More <laughs> spectroscopy or biological stuff. Yes. Okay, I think with this, we have uh, been talking for more than half an hour, which we were supposed to do. And I think we've had some very interesting comments and thoughts from you guys. 
and uh, the audience has contributed and listened, I hope. And it's all going to be, this is all video, right? So we'll have it later. All video will all come on YouTube on the Lund University channel. Yeah, so we can see ourselves again. Yeah, well, we'd love to do that. I so <laughs> I, think, I think we should thank the audience and then we should thank the speakers. Thank you.